Hello, everyone. My name is Ethan Donald. I am the CEO of Tridy Technologies, makers of ExactFlat, the leading program in the world for 3D to 2D digital patterning. I'm joined today by Mark Jewell, one of the technical architects of ExactFlat. And we're going to be working through a project today in ExactFlat for SOLIDWORKS 2018. And we're focusing on transportation interiors. Uh, this could be, for example, of uh, seating um, in an automotive sense, uh, door panels, center console, steering wheels, shift knobs, uh, floor liners, uh, aircraft interiors, marine interiors, bus interiors, anything that is soft, upholstered, fabricable inside things that move. Uh, we're going to be working on a piece that looks like an upholstered car seat. And Mark, I will uh, ask you to please walk our listeners through the process. We're interested in the workflow elements. I may interrupt you along the way to uh, highlight certain elements, but I'm going to leave it to you to do a quick little demonstration of how you can go from a 3D digital design to pattern pieces ready to be cut. If we can do that, please, maybe just load up the file. Yeah, thanks very much, Eaton. So, uh, yes, I'm going to show a car seat, as you said, and just open that up. Um, now, the car seat could originate from laser scan. It could be from CATIA, uh, NX, uh, any of the CAD packages. So, as you can see, we have the car seat here, and it's been designed in different uh, sections by the um, design engineer. Uh, we are a gold partner of SOLIDWORKS. So as soon as I open up the file, you can see we have our ribbon here. So create a piece, convert to ExactFlat, and uh, we have a database. So ExactFlat runs on a database, and that's how we become very accurate when we flatten. Um, database includes information on the material properties, different hardware types, etc. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go in, I want to create the pieces. So I simply hit create piece and I select the pieces that I want to use. Now, as you can see, if I move this up, we have a red arrow. When I hover over, it turns blue. This just shows me the fabric direction. So this fabric is pointing up, and that's the way I want it to be. I'll just hit this create piece here, and I'm just gonna create the next piece. I'll change the arrow so it's showing the up arrow. And let's go through and select these pieces here. Again, select the up arrow. So Mark, and I'm assuming the arrow is for uh, material types that have a uh, different outside and inside surface. Say for example, for leather, one side is finished, the other side is unfinished. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And basically it gives the uh, operator, when this gets to the cuttings table, they know that this is the up, up. So when everything's laid flat on the cutting table, this would be the direction of the material so I'll we'll create that piece, and then we're just gonna go again, create these pieces here. And we'll do this piece right here. And I noticed when you uh, create a piece, it becomes transparent. Are you able to select through pieces in the case of layers, if there's a layered, like fabric layer? Yeah, absolutely. So if this, uh, was a piece that was uh, maybe two or three layers. As I select the layer for creating the piece, the layer underneath would still be uh, retain its color. So you can actually go through multiple layers and, and select the, uh, the fabric that way. So for example, in transportation seating, there's often like a, a comfort layer of a foam or something like that that's underneath the material itself. Um, you'd be able to select right through the uh, top layers to the bottom, to the, to the underlying layers. Absolutely. That's exactly it. So once we've selected our layers, uh, simply going to hit this green uh, checkbox, our OK checkbox, or we have the checkbox up here as, as well. And that just uh, acknowledges that we selected our pieces, we're ready to go to our next environment, which is converting this from a um, SOLIDWORKS render mesh to exact flat. I uh, simply hit this convert to exact flat button and I'll quickly go through, take those seven pieces and convert them into a exact flat mesh. And the reason that this is important is exact flat, uh, the mesh type actually allows us to uh, apply an FEA analysis to the fabric. So when we flatten it, we can see where the stress and the strain is. Um, 
As you can see right now, we're in our material assignment um, section, and this is where I would select material for the car seat. So uh, one thing about exact flat, we can select multiple material types. So I can select every piece as a separate material if I wanted, or we can simply highlight all the pieces and select this say as a leather. Once the uh, material's been selected, I simply hit OK. And what this is gonna do is take that leather uh, material and apply it to the 3D model. So it's going to simulate leather onto this 3D piece. So when you say apply, it's going to what, assign characteristics of leather to the geometry of the pattern piece? Exactly. So, so I'm assuming those characteristics then are used uh, as input into your flattening simulation algorithms. Is that correct? That's exactly it, Eaton. What it's going to do is it's going to go through. It's basically now, uh, and you can see the material has changed. The, the seats changed from a gray to a red. That's indicating that I have a new material, in this case, leather. And uh, as you said, it's going to take the material, the yarn weft of leather, apply it to that 3D model. So when we flatten it, we get a very extremely accurate flat pattern that once sewn back onto the 3D shape would have no stress, strain, or sag. Um, this is where I'm going into the flattener. So I'll just click that. And you can see over here, and I'll just expand it out, we have our 3D piece on our left side. And you can see that there's uh, some strain. So we've applied that uh, FEA uh, mesh on top and it's showing where the strain would be on this car seat. Any um, indication of red is about 20% strain, and white here would be no strain at all. So exact flat's a two-step flattener. The first step is giving a projected flat, which this is. So it's basically like taking a, a hammer and hitting the seat and fracturing it into patterns over on the right side, but we haven't optimized these patterns. So we haven't actually um, started the algorithms that are gonna take leather and apply it to the 2D piece. So this is what I'm gonna do next. Um, before I do that, I'm simply gonna use a remeshing tool that we call. So if I look at the, the mesh here, we have you know small triangles over here, big triangles over there. Uh, it's not uniform. So I'm gonna use a uniform remeshing algorithm and this is going to help in our flattening uh, help with the flattening algorithm so you can see it's now applied a very uniform mesh across the piece and the next step is hitting my optimize button and now we're going to apply the um, leather uh, material metric and we'll flatten it out based on that so in a second you'll see the pattern status will start ticking up once we get to 100%, like this piece here is just completed optimization, and it'll go through each piece rather quickly and apply uh, the leather simulation to that 2D piece. So we've got one last piece here that it's working on, which is this front piece, which is, as you can see, has some um, very extreme curvature And it's considering that geometry and figuring out the best way to create a flat pattern piece. And we're almost done. We're at 91% now. And I see the, the highlights there. I guess the highlight would indicate areas of strain or sag. Yes. This dark area here is about 2% sag in the material. So 2% isn't too bad. And this uh, cyan color is about a 4% strain. So this is gonna work out very well. Uh, I'm assuming then by, in, in highlighting those colors, the algorithm must be searching for areas of strain, strain and sag. Yes. And when it finds it, it tries to reorient the geometry of the pattern piece to eliminate the strain and sag. Exactly. I would assume also that some geometry, when you apply some material types, will yield different flat patterns. Is that correct? It will. Yeah, uh, every material flatten a little bit differently. I mean, there's some materials that are fairly similar, but leather is a very, uh, you know, if you've got a leather jacket, you know it doesn't have very much um, 
uh, I guess, uh, stretchiness to it. Let's put it that way. Um, so in this case, it's gone through the seat, and then we can look at the 3D model here, and you can see it's quite, we've gotten rid of quite a bit of the uh, red, so there isn't a lot of strain, and this to me is a very developable uh, seat, or a very manufacturable seat now. I'll just uh, simply hit OK here, and it's going to take our flat pieces and bring us to our next step, which is actually where we will be uh, arranging the pieces and adding seams and notches. So it's going through, it's rebuilding each one of these pieces and it's going to give us a, uh, what we call our pattern view. All right, so we have our 3D seat. I'm gonna go into the pattern view and here's our flat surfaces eaten. So we have them, uh, all seven pieces here. So these are the optimized surfaces from the, um, from the flattening process. One of the things that we hear is a common complaint about the traditional 2D pattern making process is that the pieces are not associated with one another. They are individual separate pieces. You have to walk the patterns, build the seam references, all that kind of stuff. Now I'm assuming things are different in an exact flat. Um, why don't you go ahead and show us how the uh, associations between adjacent pieces, adjacent scenes, and so on are maintained in the 2D um, uh, process as they, as they were developed in the 3D process. Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, what we can do is basically, if I look at my model view, which is our 3D view, all this information has now been, um, with the leather, has now been projected onto our 2D pieces. So for instance, if I move this piece up here, I'm just, uh, show you how the piece association works. I'll just move this up here. And um, let's go around, and this is in millimeters, so I'm gonna put a, uh, a gap here of, let's say, 70 millimeters, so I can show you how piece association works. And once I click a uh, part here, what you'll notice is, as soon as I click it, it pulls the piece that is uh, adjoining to it. So as I go around and select pieces, it's gonna go around and find the piece that belongs to that piece or how that piece would get sewn together. So we simply go around the, the object and we click uh, the different areas. And as we click an area, as you can see, now we have all our pieces. Now I'm just gonna move this out a little bit here. Whoops. And once I do that, uh, we can go in and we can do add our, our seams. I'll just go in here so we have a little bit better uh, view. And I'm just gonna close so the, our... The, so what you've just demonstrated there is the associations of one pattern piece being adjacent to another pattern piece, that's maintained and therefore, you can very easily find those pieces just by clicking on an edge. Exactly. And um, another thing I should note is uh, once we've gone into our flattening, uh, we've opened up a whole new dialog box. So this ribbon here is all exact flat um, features. So we've, we're still in the SOLIDWORKS environment or the 3D CAD environment, but now we have all our uh, 2D markings and uh, notching tools. So if I go into my seam, for instance, and I'm just going to put a couple of seams on here so you can see how easy it is. I'll just select the seam and um, I'll select an edge that I want the seam to go on. So say this edge here. And as you can see, as I select one edge here, the other edge automatically shows up. Actually, let's just do that again. Should just click on a different edge. And, like, it doesn't have to be yeah. that one. Let's click on a different edge and show it again. Okay, so I'll just click on this, the, the adjoining edge. And as I do, you can see it's now connected this right along. So we, what, do the, what do the green and red dots on the endpoints of the seam indicate? So the, the green dot is your start for your start sew, for the sewing instructions for your sewers. So this would be the start and the red would be the stop. So the sewer would know, okay, I've got a sew here. I go here, you see this little roadmap, it gives a little jog here. So it shows that these three pieces all get sewn as 
together. So you do not have to manually define those associations. Once again, those are inherited from the fact that you started with 3D digital design. And this, I would say, would be a very compelling business reason for companies to adopt 3D. The fact that you get these associations essentially for free, um, while in the 2D world, you would have to build these associations manually. Yeah, exactly. They're a huge, huge time saving. And whenever you have to do manual work, you open yourself to errors. And so this sort of automation would be a tremendous time saver as well as uh, a way to build quality into your design process and your product development process. Exactly. And the other thing that saves a lot of time is um, when we go to add our notches. So it, here, where I have my seam properties, I have different seam types. So I have a six millimeter, which is being added here, but I can go to my drop down. Let's say this was an eight millimeter, or let's say a 10 millimeter top stitch. Now, what I'll do is I'll zoom in and you can see as soon as I hit 10 millimeter, look what happens to the seam. It basically adds that extra uh, four millimeters. So I visually have an indication that, okay, this is a 10 millimeter seam. Next thing I want to do. It added, on, it added the, the, the um, it made the change on both edges as well. Yeah, exactly. So whatever um, one edge treatment, it's going to add those to the other two, unless it's told not to. But in this case, they're all symmetrical. These edges have to be, uh, let's say, 10 millimeters. So you set that at 10 millimeters. The next thing I want to do is put in a notch because we've got to, the sewers have to know where to sew this together. So I'm going to put in a uh, half centimeter V notch. We'll just hit OK here. And I've got this set at three, uh, a specific count of three. So uh, if I zoom out, you can see there's one, two, three. But what I want to do is I'm going to say add, let's make it six instead of three. I'll just type in six here. And we'll look. And once I have six, you can see that it's added those six to the piece. So it's double the notches. Or another option I have is I can go into a specific spacing, in this case, 101 millimeters. And uh, it's basically added these to, the, to that. So we can go from a specific count of, say, six or um, eight. Or so we can... Notches, notches are one of those things, again, in the 2D modeling world or the 2D CAD world that are um, problematic. They're problematic because you put a notch on one piece and then you have to find its location almost by eyeballing it, right? There's some uh, measurement tools, but you, you, you kind of have to eyeball the adjacent notch location. And then you have to walk the pattern, uh, starting at the beginning of the seam and kind of walking along the edge um, to make sure your notches line up. And there's a considerable amount of effort put into aligning notches. So what I've taken away from this is that this is another element which is inherited from 3D. I'm assuming the notch locations can be put on both pieces identically because the associations are inherited from the 3D model. Is that, is that how this works? Yeah, it is exactly how it works. So, um, and the other thing is if I was to add a, so if I go back and I, I want to add a seam to say this uh, edge here, this piece here, and this piece here, it automatically remembers what my last um, seam allocation was. So it's put a 10 millimeter seam and it's added the notches based on the past or previous seams. So I don't have to go back and change anything. So uh, again, another time saving. So whether you're using a notch counter, you're specifying your notches by, by distance between, um, once you have the, the setting, all it requires is for you to pick the edge and the notches are applied. Exactly. So um, that's it uh, for the notching and showing how the seams work. Was You can see it saves a tremendous amount of time. Um, the next thing I'd want to do is uh, go in and basically create a marker set. And um, so to view my marker, I'll just click here. And here's our car seat. Um, I'm going to nest this. So basically... Let me interrupt here for a second. Yeah, sure. So you've just launched a marker view and the piece is already populated in the marker view. And I'm assuming there's some settings to come, but right. it did not require you to save your file and export it. No, exactly. The with the current technology in the marketplace, you, you would have to save your pattern pieces as DXF files 
and then you bring them into your marker view. And again, there'd be individual pieces. You'd have to assign lay rules and all this other type of stuff to it. Um, walk me through the process here. And um, I'm just calling out the fact that I, I, it, the, the markers were automatically um, inheriting your 2D work. So we have from 3D to 2D, the 2D patterning inherited the associations from 3D. And now we go into the marker view and the markers inherent, uh, pardon me, inherit the, the attributes of the 2D files into the marker process. Let's, let's just go through and go through the marker process now. Okay, so once I have the marker set up, I simply just hit nest. And in this case, what I'm gonna do is I've created, I'm gonna create 20 car seats, let's say. So I've programmed into the system to accept this as 20, mark, uh, 20 car seats. So I'll just hit nest here and nest here. And you'll see in a second, uh, the nester will kick in. And there we go, we've got now 20 seats and they're basically ready to go and get cut. They're gonna go through and it's gonna run for about a minute. And you can set the- uh, But I noticed, the, I noticed there's a grain line uh, in these images. Um, the grain line, it was, I'm assuming assigned from the material properties assignment that you did during the flattening process. Yeah, exactly. So when I selected the material that I selected, it has assigned a grain direction based on the material um, specification. So uh, this is really important in things like uh, composites or uh, materials that may have a certain way that they have to be sewn or cut. So that information is all uh, gathered up once we've selected the material and selected the um, 3D model where the material goes. So, so this I is, see also there at the bottom mm -hmm. uh, that there's a cost. Yes, exactly. So and so the costing data that's part of the material assignment that you that you had applied when you did the flattening as well. Yes. So the the uh, the nesting is going to uh, attempt to get 100% uh, yield out of the material, uh, which is pretty much <laughs> extremely difficult. Uh, but what it also does will give us a cost. So a cost before and a cost after. What our cost right now says that for and uh, for each one of these uh, seats, uh, we have a cost of two dollars and fifteen cents per per marker. Now that's uh, based on um, a fictitious uh, number that was assigned. Uh, I'm using a dollar a a dollar a yard for material costs. Okay. So that was, that was very straightforward. Um, and I just want to go back and uh, if we can talk about how this became so easy. So there's a database underpinning the exact flat product. Talk yes. a little bit about that database in more detail, if you wouldn't mind. Basically, if I go into my database and I'll just connect to our sample database that we're using, we have information like uh, construction type features, uh, labels, uh, what we were talking about here was the uh, uh, material. So if I go into uh, uh, my material manager, we'd have information, say, if I select the material, the name of the material, the nesting properties of the material. In this case, uh, the lay rule would be anyway, so the material can be laid anyway. And uh, so you wouldn't have to set that up every single time you ran a marker for this material. No, exactly. So once you select the material and it gets associated to the 3D model, all the 2D pieces, the lay rules, the costing, um, the roll width, the maximum length of the material is all uh, associated to the piece. Okay, so perhaps on a different day, we can take a deeper dive into the exact flat database because it is one of the ways that we can inherit um, efficiencies from upstream work. So from 3D to 2D, from 2D to marker, from 2D to, to, to documents. I'd like to talk about documentation now if we could. So if you can uh, exit yeah. out of here and show sure. us how we would create a, a design review documentation or assembly instructions or things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just uh, close out of the database and I'll show you exactly how we uh, do that. So if I go into my uh, edit tools or my file, sorry, I can make a drawing from the part. I simply, what we're doing is we're piggybacking on the uh, SOLIDWORKS drawing tools, which are really good. 
and we'll just select our sheet size and we'll drag our piece on here so I can either just do it as a sketch or I can create a um, shaded view and we could go in and we can do things uh, change the scale if we want use a custom scale maybe this is better at um, one to two and um, what you'll see here is we have our notching information we have our seam that we had drawn here so that basically shows if we were uh, creating a mini or a shop floor drawing where things would have to get sewn and exactly where everything gets lined up we can go into a piece table and create a piece table for this here or uh, um, in my piece table i'm assuming you mean uh, pattern piece table, right? That's yeah. um, just a list of the pattern pieces. Yeah, exactly. So I'll just say, uh, you know, piece ID one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the name of the piece. And those, uh, those piece names, I'm assuming you could have customized when you created the pattern pieces in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it can either take on the name of the model itself and assign a piece name. Uh, so it'd be uh, Ford seat one, Ford seat two, or whatever, however you want to set it up. Uh, you can. The other things that we can add is a, a, a piece balloon, so I can have kind of call outs for the pieces this way. And um, this tip the green checkbox here. And the next thing we could do is stuff like an edge balloon. So if we had an edge and we want to call out an edge um, name, and of course I don't have an edge here, but we could actually do uh, name the edge and actually have the information. So this is edge one and we could say get sewn to edge two. So there's quite a bit of uh, capability here to create a drawing quickly and give that out, print it out as a PDF or assembly instructions for our shop floor people. So one of the takeaways for me here is that um, the workflow is highly integrated. It's integrated into um, um, upstream steps and downstream steps are very highly integrated, as well as it's very integrated into um, different aspects of the, um, of, of the um, process you have to go through. Nesting is integrated with patterning. Pat, uh, patterning is integrated with documentation. Uh, flattening is integrated with, uh, with, um, with um, the 3D to 2D. Um, all of this is, uh, is highly, highly, highly integrated. And that's one of the reasons why it's so fast. Yeah, exactly. So basically if we, uh, just go back, as I said, within, um, relatively like this car seat could be, uh, created in less than, uh, 15 minutes. You can have the patterns, the nest, the documentations all ready to go. Okay. Well, I think uh, we'll save for a different day, a deep dive into documentation. We'll save for a diff different day, a deep dive into nesting and a deep dive into our database. Uh, but this has just been a beginner introduction to 3D to 2D digital patterning, some of the advantages of the transformation of digital as a whole, and some of the advantages of an integrated workflow where the tool set is the same and the work that you do upstream is automatically populated into the work you have to do downstream. Whether it be getting a file from your customer in whatever format that is, like a TIA, Unigraphics, PTC, SOLIDWORKS native file, Rhino file, um, a solid edge file, whatever it might be, or even a laser scan file. And then you're in essentially one environment to do the rest of your work and that's why it's so fast. Absolutely. Mark? Thank you for your time today. If people want to know more, they can go to the exactflat.com website. Additionally, they can go to digitalpatterning.net. That's our blog, www.digitalpatterning.com. Or pardon me, digitalpatterning.net. That's www.digitalpatterning.net. And you'll see a wealth of information there about 3D to 2D digital patterning and a variety of other related um, workflows that are uh, uh, either before or after the patterning process. And if um, you want to talk to somebody directly, why don't you send us an email to sales at exactflat.com. 
and we'll have an expert reach out to you. Mark, thanks for your time today. I think we'll call it there. Thanks, Eaton. Okay, take care.